got to say, I was a little concerned uh, following Ali, and I told my agent I didn't want to follow a CNN anchor. That was dangerous. But, you know, the, the fact is actually he's, he, his ideas lead right into mine, so I'm feeling okay about it now. So uh, my name is Jay Green. I, uh, I've been a journalist all my professional life. I spent uh, 10 years uh, writing for Business Week. I was their Seattle bureau chief, and uh, I left Business Week last December and finished writing a book uh, about design and innovation called Design is How It Works. Uh, and Penguin, Penguin released it about two months ago now. So I, I want to talk a little bit about some of these points actually Ali brought up, uh, about communicating your ideas, but I want to be a little bit counterintuitive. I, I want to suggest some strategies that you might want to use as you talk with folks like us um, that might not seem particularly obvious or even wise, uh, but I'm going to make the case to you that they really are. And I want to jump off with an idea that um, uh, uh, Peter Diamandis raised yesterday on the innovation panel, and he talked about the importance of embracing failure and even rewarding it. Um, you know, and the point was that uh, some of the greatest risks you can take end up in failure, and it happens, but some of those greatest failures uh, leave, lead to uh, wonderful insights. And so I'm here to tell you that you need to talk publicly about your failures. You need to let the world know it when you blow it. And that's counterintuitive. It might not sound obvious. Um, no one likes to be held up to public ridicule. Uh, no one likes to be raked over the coals. But, but here's why it's important. You need to let everyone know in your company, in your lab, in your organization, that failure's okay. It, it means you're willing to take big risks in order to achieve big breakthroughs. Uh, it also means you're willing to learn from your mistakes and not sweep them under the rug. Uh, and so I'll give you an example from my book. Um, I wrote about a company called Cliff Bar. Uh, it's not an engineering company by any stretch of the imagination, but it's, it's an actually very innovative company nonetheless. And there's some lessons in Cliff Bar that are instructive, and one of them, to me anyway, is how the company deals with failure. And so, a few years ago, well, Cliff Bar, for those of you who don't know, and I'm guessing most of you probably do, but they make energy foods for athletes, you know, bars and goo and protein foods to help runners and cyclists and climbers uh, perform at their peak. And a few years ago, there was this thing called the low-carb craze, and everybody was on the Atkins diet. And uh, Cliff Bar got a lot of pressure uh, from uh, their buyers, from their lenders, to jump on that bandwagon. They figured that's where the next business opportunity was. And, and never mind that Cliff Bar's entire business strategy was about shoving carbs down your gullet so you'd have some energy to perform well. Uh, Cliff Bar ignored its better instincts, dumped a lot of money into this business, launched something called the Luna Glow. It had just two carbs. And guess what? It bombed. I mean, it cost the company a, mil a million dollars. But here's the interesting thing to me. All the senior executives at Cliff Bar openly discuss the Luna Glow debacle uh, with anyone who asks, in in including journalists like me. Um, it pains them to talk about it. It isn't a fun conversation, but there are lessons to be learned from the experience. And, and the primary one in this case was that um, the company failed because it made an inauthentic product. Uh, and, and the reason they talk with folks like me is they want everyone, every employee at the company to know the story so it's never repeated. It's part of the company folklore. You know, so the point here is failure is painful, but it's instructive. And, and if you hide your missteps, even from journalists, maybe even especially from journalists, uh, you're much more likely to repeat them. All right, so counterintuitive idea number two. Um, sometimes small is bigger than you think. And so actually, so I was thinking about this yesterday when uh, Lockheed Martin's uh, Jeff Wilcox made this point. He was discussing uh, the decision to stop painting the space shuttle fuel tanks white in order to shave some weight off of them, make them viable. And that's hardly an innovation on the magnitude of the 14 grand challenges. Uh, but I've got to tell you, it's a great story. Uh, if I was a journalist covering aerospace, I would have just eaten that thing up. So let me give you another example from my book. And, um, it, it's a little innovation that really became a successful product. Okay, it's a staple remover. Really, it's a staple remover. Uh, it's made by a company called OXO. And some of you will know about OXO. They make kitchen gadgets. They make a really cool vegetable peeler. Uh, they have these measuring cups that are awesome where you pour water in and you can actually see uh, how much liquid is in the measuring cup so you don't have to cock your head and look at it. I mean, it's, they're, they're clever folks. But a few years ago, uh, OXO decided to bring its design shops to office supplies. And one of the first products they, uh, they came up with was a staple remover. Now, now, it's hard to really imagine innovation in staple removing technology. Uh, but, you know, they found that 
people get really frustrated with those claw-like staple removers that, you know, rip paper when you're trying to pull them out. And so they, you know, they put some innovative design minds, engineers to this task, and they came up with something that was really novel and really simple. And so I don't have it with me, but it's, it's a staple mover that kind of looks like um, a, a letter opener. It has a little tongue. And what's cool is that the, the tongue gradually gets wider and thicker as it gets to the base. And that way the staple just gradually disengages from the paper as you slide the staple remover over it. Okay, so, you know, like Rocky Martin's, uh, you know, paint revelation, this is hardly the stuff of a Nobel Prize. It's a small breakthrough, but it turned into a hugely successful product. Um, and, and what's inter interesting is that, you know, this thing costs actually six times as much as those claw-like staple removers, but it's one of the, I think, top two or three products in the office products category for OXO. And it's a great story. It's creative, and it's interesting, and it's the kind of stuff that folks like writing about, and I think you guys might even like hearing about. All right, so that gives me, uh, it brings me to counterintuitive idea number three. And this, uh, you know, it's the opposite of this, which is sometimes big is a lot smaller than you think it is. So uh, when I work for Business Week, I live in Seattle. I wrote a lot about Microsoft. That's what you do when you live in Seattle. Um, and, you know, one of the things I quickly learned about Microsoft is that uh, one of its core competencies is, hi is uh, in hiring. They, they hire really smart people and, you know, no place is that more evident in their research group. You know, the, the, the company collects brilliant engineers the way a seven-year-old collects baseball cards. I mean, they're just smart, smart folks there. And, you know, these, these, you know, great minds come up with terrific breakthroughs. So eight years ago, I wrote a story about, um, uh, is for Business Week, about how the company was about to launch this, its tablet PC with some partners. And so this is a laptop computer, and, you, you, you know, you'd open it up, you'd flip the screen over, you put it back down, and you could write on it. But then when you put the screen back up, it was just like a laptop computer again. And there's some really smart folks at Microsoft that developed, you know, some clever technology that could do a really great job translating handwriting to text. All right, and there's some other folks there who came up with this font technology where, um, you know, they eased eye strain by the way the fonts were rendered. Um, it was pretty impressive stuff. Um, it, and, you know, uh, I still remember talking with, with Bill Gates about this for a story, and he said, you know what, in just a few years, every company that makes a laptop will be making a tablet computer, and it'll be because of some of these breakthroughs. And, and the fact is, it didn't work out that way. And he said, and you go, why? I mean, Bill's a super smart guy, too, right? Um, what went wrong? And so I have some thoughts, but one of it is that, that writing to text technology is really clever, no doubt. But was it useful, right? I, I do a lot of writing. I interview folks, take down notes, I read books, jot down some ideas. I've rarely found the need to translate my own writing to text. Um, I'm pretty good at reading it, actually. And, and, you know, when I want to convey my ideas to others, I select the relevant bits, I add a bit of context, maybe flavor and a little bit of color, type it up and send it off. It, it's a great bit of technology, but it wasn't a mainstream application, and it certainly wasn't the mainstream application Microsoft thought it was. And, and what about that nifty font technology? It was called ClearType, if you're keeping score, and some of you may remember it. And actually, it's in every version of Windows today. It really is great technology. But the idea back then was, you know, you do this, and folks can actually use it to read books. Well, you know, um, it, it turns out that uh, if you hold a four-pound tablet PC in your hand like a book for more than about 15 minutes, you're going to just die. I mean, that thing's brutal. And, you know, so it, it was a great technology. But, you know, co contrast that to, you know, uh, to Miles' iPad there, right? He's, I think he's playing video games on it now. But, the, um, <laughs> but that's pound and a half, right? And uh, the new Kindle that's coming out is eight and a half ounces, right? So these were big breakthroughs. But they weren't as big as Microsoft thought they were. Um, it, you know, and, the, and the fact is they wound up being niche applications and consumers didn't really care. And, and you know, I guess the lesson is don't drink your own bathwater. Um, you can come up with great breakthroughs, but, you know, there are those times they aren't going to be as big as you think they are. And, and the last point I'll make, and it isn't particularly counterintuitive, and it kind of plays off a little bit about what Ali was talking about, um, and, and I think it's important in a room full of big-brained engineers, uh, you know, be relevant, make things understandable. Um, some of the, the work that some of the folks in this room are doing is, is quite frankly, imponderable to mere, mere mortals like me. I, Matthew might actually pick up on this stuff, but sometimes it's, it's a little bit tough for me. I mean, you know, guys like Peter Diamandis or, you know, with his XPRIZE awards or uh, Paul DeBevick yesterday talked about some of the photorealism work he does in movies. I get that. that, that they, they, you know, that's easy, right? But, you know, 
when you start talking about some of these, these grand challenges, you know, developing carbon sequestration methods or, or reverse engineering the brains, you got your work cut out for you. It doesn't mean you should give up, right? But you need to figure out how to make it relevant um, because it's too easy for scientists, engineers, mathemat and mathematicians, even journalists uh, to get wrapped up in their own brilliance. You need to explain why it matters. And, and not just why it matters to scientists and engineers, you need to explain why it matters to me and why it matters to my 15-year-old son or my 78-year-old mother. Um, what you're doing matters. And, and, you know, if we can do anything today, it's about helping you convey it, because it really does matter. And so with that, I'll turn it back over. But thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Let's bring up the house lights. If you have questions, uh, find your way.